you. And what will you say when I'm actually up for re-election? That's what I want to know. I'm Carol Troy and Lowy. I'm a trustee of this library and a very proud member of the committee to commemorate John Wilson. Many of you came to town hall in late January to celebrate the result of a year-long effort led by the committee and the Wilson family and Martha Richardson, John's representative and friend, um, to acquire the majestic sculpture of Martin Luther King Jr. for our town. But our work wasn't finished on that glorious <coughs> afternoon. We, the committee, feel it's important that we continue to celebrate John Wilson, who was, as you know, a longtime resident of Brookline, celebrate him as a great American artist and as a contributor to the artistic life of our community and of Greater Boston. So before I introduce today's speaker, who has been a fundamental part of spreading the word about John Wilson, I want to tell you about two upcoming exhibitions that you really do want to see. First, opening at the Marcia, Martha Richardson Fine Arts Gallery at 38 Newbury Street in about six weeks is a show titled John Wilson, Prince and Related Drawings. As I said, Martha is John Wilson's representative, lives in Brookline, and invites all of you to the opening reception on Saturday, May 4th from 2 to 5 public is welcome. It's a good way to get a first look at some of John Wilson's most beautiful works on paper. It's an event not to be missed. The show runs through June. And touring the country right now and coming to the Yale Art Gallery in New Haven in January of next year is Reckoning with the Incident, John Wilson Studies for a Lynching Mural. The exhibition will feature a full-scale reproduction of John's 1950, John Wilson's, I feel like I know him, of John Wilson's 1952 mural, as well as many of his powerful studies for it. So it's not to be missed. Now, the best thing you can do to gain an appreciation of John Wilson's work is to look at it. In the exhibitions I've mentioned, at museums around Boston. I'm proud to say the MFA has a fine collection of his work. And now at Brookline's Town Hall. But the next best thing is something you've already done. You're here today to hear from Barry Gaither, an expert on Wilson's work and one of his longtime friends. Edmund Barry Gaither has been the director of the Museum of the National Center for Afro-American Artists in Roxbury since 1969. He started when he was 11. <laughs> uh, he's also, as you've heard, a special consultant to the MFA. He has degrees from Morehouse College and Brown University, and honorary degrees and other citations from Rhode Island College, Framingham State, Northeastern, and more. He has written and organized exhibitions about such acclaimed artists as Louis, excuse me, Lois Melu Jones, Joseph Norman, Richard Yard, Robert Blackburn, and of course, John Wilson. If I were to mention even a fraction of the institutions and organizations that he has served as a consultant, commissioner, lecturer, or fellow, there wouldn't be any time for him to talk. And in many ways, talking about works of art is what Barry Gaither does best. He is a brilliant teacher and a master storyteller, and I'm really pleased that he was willing to come here today and share with us John Wilson's story and his own insights into Wilson's distinguished career and masterful achievements as a painter, draftsman, and sculptor. Please join me in welcoming Barry Gaither. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My greetings to John's family, and thank you all for coming out. And I wish my business meetings would go as quickly <laughs> and as easily as that one. I would like to just share some thoughts about the theme of monumentality in John's work, and I want to rely as much as I can 
on uh, quotes from him, so that much of it is in his voice. But let me begin with a little bit of background, which perhaps you know, but we won't be any the less for hearing it again. John's parents came from British Guiana, in those days, present day Guiana, and they came not quite directly. His father uh, came to Trinidad with some small inheritance, operated a shop there, but subsequently got a job as a sh shipping clerk in Boston and came to Boston. His mother's family moved to Jamaica where her father was uh, a middle manager in the sugar refinery industry. Eventually everyone ends up in Boston. Now, John's born in 1922 and he grows up in Roxbury as a warm and welcoming community with lots of friends. The Boston black community at that point in time was a small community made up of uh, immigrants from the English-speaking West Indies, small number of southerners not like the great migration cities, and of course black Yankees who've been around the whole while. John grows up uh, in what's now often called Lower Roxbury, and that's the Roxbury Edge to South End, which is where the black community was before the Second War. He attends Boston Public Schools. In 1938, he goes to the Roxbury Boys Club, which has uh, several teachers there who are students at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. And it's there that his talent for drawing and his intuitive sense for volume begin to manifest themselves. And he deeply impresses the teachers who are there from the uh, School of the Museum of Fine Arts. This sets him on a path that leads to a 1945 diploma from the museum school, a 1947 BS from Tufts University, 1947 to 1949 travel in Europe, 1949 spent at the Atelier of Léger, 1950 to 1955 in Mexico, where he continues study and also works, and then a brief stay in Chicago, 56 to 58, then New York, and he returns to Boston in 1964 to become ultimately a professor of art at Boston University. The museum school was very, very important in his, oops, this goes with that boys club thing because this is a, an early drawing of the late 1930s and it coincides with that first uh, recognition of his draftsman skills. So uh, the museum school plays a really big part in his life, especially Carl Zerbe. In the period of the Second War, when uh, John had the opportunity to become a lithographer for the army. He thought seriously about it because work and making a living had always been concerns of his, and Zerbe persuaded him not to, that that was a wrong road to go down, and he persuaded him of that by showing him that there was a world of serious art where he could make a contribution. And that becomes uh, a turning point in his life. The time of the museum school does not include the study of sculpture, but really focuses on drawing. In summarizing a little bit of what the museum school gave him, John said the following. They taught us the figure from inside out and sensing whether a figure had an organic sense of function because of its basic design structure within. This was the days when art schools insisted 
that you know how to draw. <laughs> His early works began to raise concerns that would be important to him throughout his career. One of those was a deep desire to communicate psychological and sociological responses to life as a black man in America. This work with the little boy who's sort of like a John and his dog facing out from the street scene already has a psychological dimension that is inescapable. Even in these early times, John begins to encounter race. There was, for example, when he was still in high school, a program that existed between the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and uh, the Boston Public Schools, whereby students could come for Saturday classes on a track towards building a career in the arts. Although John was widely regarded as uh, one of the most gifted people in his high school, he was passed over. Other students got these slots. But fortunately, because of his relationship with those student teachers from the museum school, they got him in. But this was an encounter that introduced uh, institutional racism as well as the racial barriers that are omnipresent in American society. During the Great Depression, John's father lost his job and could not find another befitting his skills. This generated in John a continuing <coughs> concern about making a living and being able to support your family. And along with that also came an abiding awareness of the barriers of race. Of that, he says, one of my early concerns was not being able to earn a living. My father had skills he had learned in the sugar industry, but ones he could not use in the US. He worked at unskilled, menial jobs all of his life. John, in the arts, was strongly supported by his parents, but always in the back of his mind was, how do you make a living as an artist? And for an early point, he thought maybe he would be uh, an illustrator. At the museum school, John's performance was very good, and he fitted in uh, well, and he had strong mentors like Zerbe, whom I mentioned earlier. In spite of all of those things, he also had a remaining consciousness of the kinds of issues he could expect as a black man. This is a comment he writes reflecting on his early years at the museum school. At the museum school, I felt conflicted. I remember feeling a world that promised freedom and opportunity for everyone who worked hard. But clearly, if you're black, you realize that those nice sounding phrases did not include you. There was a sense of being relegated to the lowest depth, plus all of the other racist experiences in every aspect of the world you lived in. And he concludes by reflecting, I wanted to use this new language of art, and what I was doing were not pleasant landscapes. In this moment, John also starts to look more widely to understand the circumstances that surrounded him. And among the things that he uh, studied, he read Franz Boaz, who had basically debunked the scientific theories of race. He read James Amos Porter, who was the first systematic black art historian. He, led, he read uh, Elaine Leroy Locke, who was a forceful advocate for what became the New Negro Movement. He discovered Jacob Lawrence, Ralph Ellison, and Richard Wright. This is the image of Richard Wright that he did in 1945. Of Richard Wright, he said, a book like Native Son was a model. 
What Richard Wright was doing was forcing you to get into the psyche of black people so that you would relive it. He would shove it in your face. So that's a motivation for this kind of work. This is a small image of Paul Robeson. The quote I would tie to it is the following. There was always a tradition of protest in the black community. But translating the realities of my black world into art was a challenge I had to discover myself. It was forcing me to discover the psyche of black people so that I could create it in a way that could be relived. He concludes saying, I wanted to create images that would be as powerful as what Richard Wright and James Baldwin wrote about, but I wanted to do it visually. As all of this takes shape, a set of themes become clear in John's work. Family, friends, and community become a major subject matter. Meeting and marrying Judy Kovitz, and he, he meets and marries and begins a personal family. He's building friendships with artists such as Elizabeth Catlett, Francisco Mora, and Robert Blackburn. He's clarifying these concerns that he'd had about economic and social justice, and he's increasingly focusing on compassion, caring, familial, and social love. This leads him to fit into uh, a discovery from his travels. One of those discoveries has to do with how you represent these familial values of compassion and caring. And he saw in Mexican art a model for how to do this. In a work such as this detail from Mexican family, he could see that there was something larger than life, a sense of something universal, of some life force that intervened and that was part of the whole rhythm of life, and he sought to try and capture that. This becomes important for his commitment to figuration. He observes the following. I could have done the kind of modern experimental art that had nothing to do with figures. That was certainly a significant aspect of contemporary art. In fact, if you used figures, you were not being, quote, cutting edge. And if you used black figures, you were already socially conscious. And being a socially conscious artist was in the pits, close quote. <laughs> Despite this, you see already in works such as Richie here, this full roundness of the image, already this sense of volume, and a great penetration into the personality of the sitter. You see something of similar power in the drawing that informs a work such as Diane. So these really become important pieces of work for him. And they ally to the most important movement of the first half of the 20th century in African American art, which was the treatment of the figure. The importance of the treatment of the figure was that black imagery had largely existed in a caricatured, dehumanizing space, and the project of early 20th century black artists was to restore a sense of the humanity of black people using the figure because of its power to stimulate empathy. This brings us to another uh, piece of work. And this is his understanding of the ability of drawing to communicate other kinds of notions, such as the notion of caring. 
This is an early lithograph of a theme that was to be of lingering importance in his work, the theme of father and son. On this theme, he says, I had a strong idea about this father-child relationship from my own experience as a father. That begins to create the background which sees the evolution of this composition and subject matter through several works culminating ultimately, well, let me just put this one in. Uh, in these explorations of uh, father and son, there also is, of course, the father and child. This is uh, child with father, and in this, you see something quite striking. It is at once intimate, the child wrapped in fold in the arms, but it is also monumental. If you look at the child, the child has an enormous presence. The head of this child is already the big head theme that becomes powerful in later work of John. And this also carries forward the notion of nurturing. And these all come to play in the work titled Father and Son Reading. Now, the Father and Son reading is a work on the grounds of Roxbury Community College in Roxbury. And it's a work in which you see a father, let me just go backwards for a moment, a father who creates a sheltering space. And this space is anchored by a book at the front, which the father holds with both hands and nestled in this enclosing space is the child, an adolescent boy, standing and reading. There is a personal reflection that perhaps bears on the importance of this theme. So let me share this incident also in John's words. At one point as a kid, I had rheumatic fever and doctors restricted my physical activity. During that time, one of the things that my mother encouraged me to do was read. I used to haunt the library of the Roxbury Boys Club. I was able to leave my sort of mundane world and travel around the world in history, past and future. I was hypnotized by this world that opened up through books. What's happening in this piece, in addition to the nurturing, is that the book opens this enclosed sheltering space to all of the possibilities beyond. Because the world beyond is available, and available through knowledge. Within the moment of the child learning to read and sharing in this intimate moment, the child is also being prepared to step forward into a world that is full of stresses. So those all become really important pieces of understanding this work. Another work which wrestles with these notions of monumentality is the Martin Luther King Jr. in the nation's capital. This is a work that was commissioned in 1985 uh, through the US Congress in a process administered by the National Endowment for the Arts. It was my opportunity to serve as chair of the process, the commissioning entity for this endeavor. Uh, we set about to advertise the opportunity for a submission to, me to memorialize Dr. King. We had a couple of hundred applicants. We reduced them to three, and actually in the, in the final three were both John and Elizabeth Catlett. John, in the end, received the commission, and uh, this is how he thought about that commission. He says, I wanted the image to be animated by a feeling of quiet power, 
generated by a strong tension between the outer form and the pattern of energy within. Now let me just tell you something that most people wouldn't know about this. When John responded to the invitation to come down and see the space where the sculpture would go, he came and the space was in fact a room of about 18 feet square. That's a tall room with a domed top. If you're in the Capitol building and you walk around the outer edge of the rotunda, you'll find a number of these rooms. So that's the room for which the piece was calculated. John's concept was that the piece would be only uh, about life size, but it would be raised higher on a pedestal. Because to see it, you had to come into the smaller space and look slightly upward, and it revealed itself with a very slight and subtle turn. So this hidden power was built in that gesture of the turn. By the time the work was finished, the architect of the Capitol, George White, had changed his mind. I think he had become frightened that if he didn't put it on the, the main rotunda, he would pick up a lot of ugly weight. So the location gets changed and the piece gets moved into the outer edge of the main rotunda, where it presently is available to be seen, but where much of the calculated effect that mattered to the artist is dissipated. In the whole of this process, John sought uh, as his goal to transform the subject into a visual metaphor for his feel feelings, becoming a symbol that would be available to a wide audience for their responses. The subtle gesture was meant to give a pregnant moment a sense of space and of place. In 1982, John is commissioned to do the Martin Luther King in Buffalo. Uh, it's installed in 1983. His name had been submitted by uh, Harold Tovich, and he had been urged to apply by Lloyd Lilly, his associate at Boston University. The committee in Buffalo wanted a statue. John was not interested in doing a statue, and he offered an alternative. He offered a work in which the symbolic prevailed over the literal, in which interior power was rendered as greater than rendering of likeness, a work in which the ideal prevailed over the rhetorical. In supporting this set of ways of thinking about this kind of work, he observed that art becomes universal and becomes eternal if it is great. That's what I was aiming for. He further says, speaking of Martin Luther King as he understood him, he's not dealing with the liberation of blacks. He's trying to force a world community in harmony with each other and with the life forces of the planet. He has that kind of international and <coughs> universal significance for me. The forms are very simple in that things have been reduced to essences. Superficialities have been eliminated. These are qualities which he had come, John had come to greatly admire in other great world traditions that had influenced him in thinking about monumentality. Chief among those are the set of traditions around the creation of Buddha images. Here is a supporting tablet, which is also part of the installation in Buffalo. That brings us to the last work I want to talk about, which is Eternal Presence, installed on the ground of the Museum of the National Center of Afro-American Artists. 
The initial agreement for the creation of this work was arrived at in 1982. The formal contract for the work was drawn in 1984. The work was installed in 1987. This work was one of two commissions made simultaneously by the National Center of Afro-American Artists. One was for an orchestral piece under the title Primal Rights, which was to be written by the Jamaican-born composer Noel da Costa, working then in Paris. The other was the sculpture that John was to create. In a statement issued in, at that time, the following is said. This is a statement issued jointly by uh, Dr. Elma Lewis and myself. Eternal Presence was commissioned by the National Center of Afro-American Artists for the grounds of its museum in celebration of human creativity and spirituality from the beginning of time to the present. Eternal presence is therefore a universal statement about values that express both our humanity and our divinity. And how to get to that, John undertook a series of drawings based on studies of the head. This is one such drawing, uh, generally identified as early monumental head because at the time that the drawing was done, a title had not yet been determined for the piece. This gives you a sense of the relationship of how the description in the drawing is translated into the existence of the actual work. And this is eternal presence as it came to preside over the space. Again, this drew very heavily on the set of ideas that had been influenced by, in particular, two other sculptural traditions. The tradition of the Buddha and the traditions associated with the Olmec head. Here is a somewhat longer statement, but useful, that John gives on the influence of the notion of the Buddha and how he thought about creating this work and responding to that set of values expressed in the commission. I was very taken by Buddhist statues back in the early 1970s. Although I was teaching drawing, I knew I wanted to do sculpture. I wanted to do something with its own tangible three-dimensional existence that would have its own kind of presence, that on its own physical terms would challenge the viewer. So I did some drawings for a black head. We just saw one. I wanted to do an oversized head. Lloyd Lilly helped me make an armature, and I started with this head. It went on for two or three years, but it wasn't getting anywhere. Then I met this young woman, Roz, a friend of my daughter's. She was like living sculpture. I did a series of drawings and then started reworking the head as studies for the sculpture. About that time, I received a grant from the Mass Council to do sculpture. I was still working on the big head. It had grown to a 35-inch thing, and I realized it had to be as large as a human being. At that point, it was no longer odds. I don't think of it as either male or female. It's humanity. I wanted to make a black image that you could not ignore, that would have an enigmatic presence. It had to be larger because I wanted the eyeballs to confront you. Therefore, it had to be seven feet. It had to be a black head. It was my answer to all of the omissions. I wanted it to have the kind of universality that Rembrandt has that Piero della Francesco had, I wanted it to counteract the invisible man syndrome. Now, in order to get this whole process going, uh, the National Center invited John to submit a proposal. 
So we have in our files the earliest submitted proposal, which is in 1982. Then we have the hand reworked agreement in 1984. And finally, <coughs> this all gets us to the finished product in 1987 and to the unveiling. This is the program for the, uh, that anticipates the unveiling. But as you can see from this document, it's actually much earlier. This is the document that appeared in, at the uh, uh, performance of Primal Rights in Boston Symphony Hall. Now, what had happened between 82 and 83, when this program takes place, is we had to go out and raise the money for the commission. Miss Lewis gave me the job of figuring out how to get that done. We prepared a lot of proposals, including other ones for the State Arts Council. And one of the things that the proposals needed was they needed a name for the things. Monumental head would not suffice. Uh, and Miss Lewis was in the practice of giving assignments and then waiting for you to bring them back, done, irrespective of resources like money. So, uh, so, so I, in fact, wrote up the proposal and wrote up the names for these things that we got done, and they became real. So that's how uh, this gets to happen. In 87, we unveiled the piece. This is a clip from the New York Times announcing the unveiling of Eternal Presence in October of that year. And, oops, I lost one. I had also one there from the Globe. So these become the markers for the piece. Eternal Presence came with some special obligations. It mattered hugely to John because Roxbury was his community of birth. And it also mattered hugely to him because this was an enormous piece of his work and he wanted to be sure it was going to be looked after and cared for. So we adopted a practice not long after installing the piece of doing periodic conservation on the piece. And from time to time, usually a sort of a 10 to 12 year spectrum, we've had professional conservation for the piece. In the meantime, we wanted to give the piece a much more personal and immediate relationship to the community where it is. So about five years ago, we started an annual ritual called Putting Your Touch on Greatness. It's an opportunity for people from the community to come and wash the piece and polish it with black wax. The intent of this is to prevent it from developing any of the green tinge that typically happens to bronze in outdoor space. The green tinge is a function of uh, oxygen. It's an oxidation process. The wax serves to prevent water and air from accessing the surface and keeps the patina dark as you see it. So if you witness a little scene like this, this is one of the caretakers. It's an opportunity for generation after generation to have an intimate relationship to this great piece of work. Now let me just step backwards for a moment and make a few additional comments and then we will conclude. Here are a few additional comments about this piece that I would underscore. John was very uh, adamant that the sculpture should not have a pedestal, that it should rise out of the earth as you see it here. That's because in many stories, 
uh, religious and otherwise about the origin of the human family. It's emphasized that we are the same minerals as the earth. And in most traditions, the head stands in as a symbol of intelligence. And because we have intelligence and intellect, we can be creative, we can learn, and we can be held responsible. So in this formulation, you see the head rising from the earth as if the earth were shoulders to the head, expressing this physical relationship. And at the same time, you see the head prevailing over all of this, as we presume to do in the natural environment. Not long after the piece was installed, it started to have its own emotional life. There was a naming ceremony just outside of the piece, uh, inspired by Alex Haley's roots. If you read the book, I saw the movie, you may remember the scene where the uh, boy is lifted to the moon and given his name. Such a thing happened in the presence of this piece in its first year of being there. Subsequently, it has been in lots of weddings and in lots of wedding photographs, where it has, in effect, stood in for family who couldn't come. This notion of the universality has been carried out in the way in which it's neither male nor female, because each of us, the product of mother and father, is both simultaneously. So it embraces all of that. Also, it's generally described as a youth. That's fine. I have a different phrase I prefer. I prefer to say it represents the age of maximum possibility, when you can still do what you have in mind. So it's not so young that it needs the parental support, and it's not so old that infirmities reign. But it is in that great time when you are most completely yourself as agent. If you look carefully at the eyes, you'll see there's no pupil represented in the eyes. It's also a feature of the Olmec works. It is a feature of the medieval Nigerian works that exist under Ife art and uh, under well, not so in Benin, in, in Ife art. So that has a tradition. We say that the eyes are the window to the soul, but uh, by not showing the pupil, the head takes on this enormous contemplative presence, but is emotionally nonspecific. So all of these values come there. The last thing I'll tell you about it is the meaning of this title because the meaning of this title is deduced from many, many conversations with John. We exist only in the present. A moment ago is past, a moment from now is still future. If we imagined time like a great line, the beginning is so far in the past we don't know where, and the other, the future end, so far in the future we don't know where. But each of us is like a dot, sliding along that line, converting the past into the future, into the past, through the present. Despite the fact that we only live fleeting existences, we have, because of this head, the capacity to imagine something unchanging. And we speak of beauty and love and God in these terms that are unchanging. So eternal presence calls upon us to meditate on the tension of how we, in our temporariness, in our fleeting lives, try to organize meaning from something eternal and unchanging. You live in 
Greater Boston. You can go visit all of these works. So I give you as an assignment going to see every one of them along with yours here and coming to know them by being in their presence. Thank you very much. <laughs>